All right, thank you. Thank you so much for staying with us. Um, so once again, everybody, we have with us the producer, Yunit uh, Manasan Ramon, uh, who is a documentary film producer, whose films include uh, Dolphin Boy, which actually screened at Boston Jewish Film Festival in 2011. Uh, she's currently writing her PhD thesis in media psychology, and she teaches cinema therapy. Uh, also with us is Dr. Yal Barda, who is the Ger Jared Weinstock Visiting Lecturer in Sociology at Harvard University. Uh, she's Assistant Professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Hebrew University, and she teaches Sociology of Law, State Bureaucracies, and Sociology of Empires and Society in Israel. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, Yudit, um, can you um, can you uh, tell us how you got to uh, produce this film? What's the relationship between uh, you and Avi, and how did that come about? So you can see in the, the screen the type of uh, person Avi is. He's a very likable person. We worked in the past together, and usually, because in documentary you have you're not going to make millions of dollars. You have to commit and to really relate to the story and know that it's something you're running with for a while. Uh, so once someone comes to you with a story, if you can envision it and see what, it, where it's, what story is gonna be told in film, then at least that's my thing, then I go with it. Um, and Avi's story was fascinating about the Aleppo Codex. It doesn't matter that what you start from and what you end with is, has nothing to do with each other because, because it was done in six years. So many has changed. So many things have changed on the, on the way. Um, but that was the beginning. The beginning was in 2012. All right, so six years, huh? Six years, yeah. Nice. And it's, the project is continuing. This is, there's a, a continuing pro, um, project of this which is a VR project, which is going to be in the uh, Israel Museum in 2021. And there's a website which has more information than the film, which the IPBC, the Israeli Public Network, um, has put up, which were, we collaborated with. Um, and uh, it has the chapters of the story, and people can come and add information they have, so it will be kind of a community search of the Lost Crown. It's called the Lost Crown, dot com, sorry, the lost crown, dot can, K-A-N, dot I, I actually highly recommend that you uh, visit that website. I, I checked it out uh, this afternoon before coming here, and it's, this film, as, as you saw, I mean, I saw, I saw it for the second time, and it, and it was actually so, it's actually so good seeing it twice, because it's, it's easier to follow the second time around, but the website is incredible. It is so, it's so well done and... It, it doesn't end, it's like a maze. Every time I see it, I see another thing. In right, and, and, it, and it helps you sort of go from one, um, you know, piece of the story to the next and there are clips to, to follow, so I highly recommend that you check out the website after you've seen the film today, so... Um, so, you, Yudit, it was, it was your suggestion to invite uh, Yael to, to our little panel here, so... So um, I just I want to I want to throw this at you, Yael. Can you can you speak a little bit to sort of the you know sociological and political implications of the, of this story and and uh, and you know and how how you see all of that? <laughs> um, thanks so much. I find the, the film so heart rendering because it it comes at this moment where a, there's a lot of communities in Israel. Um, that are asking themselves the question of what is the relationship between our culture or the culture of our parents and grandparents and the state. And that's being asked on many different levels. So it's, asked, it's being asked at a political level, it's being asked at the level of culture and religion, um, like who defines the type of religious practice, who is it that defines, um, so, so the types, it's not just um, a question of authority, or a question of um, um, autonomy. You know, a lot of times we think that a lot is about that, who makes the decisions, which it is, and obviously, it, you, I mean, we saw there's 12, 
12 synagogues in, <laughs> and this is 14. 14, sorry. So, so there's, there's, there's 14 synagogues and this is just a vacation spot, right? So, I mean, obviously autonomy and who's, and who's making the decisions is a very important issue. But, but beyond that is this, it's, it's a question that, that I think is asked um, near the end of the film. So there was this need at, or at least this is historically perceived, there was this need in the 50s and 60s to consolidate the state and there was, in order to do that, there was the Mamlachtiyut. And Mamlachtiyut, you know, a, I, I don't even know how you translate this word. No, the sovereignty is Ribonut. And Mamlacha is the kingdom. But it's not a kingdom because it's the state. And it's not, so it's, it's this, how do you, and, and, it's, and, it, and you think of it, it's, it's a very complicated question and also an amazing feat in many ways. And that also has to be appreciated. And I was kind of, you know, you look at, and there's this moment where you're like, oh my gosh, look at this critique of Yitzhak Ben Tzvi. And in a way, you know, like I, I, I do, I research legal history, and for me, like, that place is like a shrine. And in the, and in a moment, I'm looking and I'm saying, oh my, this, you know. These people were very human. They were also human in their ideologies, and they believed that whatever they did was okay. And I think that that's a critique that we can actually own um, today and come at it from a much stronger point, even though people seem to be very afraid, mm. still very afraid to open up and to say, you know, the fact that you critique um, the establishment, the fact that you critique the leadership doesn't mean that you're doing away with um, your commitment and your responsibility to the institutions. And I think that's, that's this question, and, and this film is very much part of this movement, right? Of saying, I'm not stopping, right? He's telling us. Nabaf is saying at the end, you know, I'm not closing this story just because I don't know what's going on. But it's also a commitment to, to, to culture and history, right? And to, to that preservation of that, and to also making that space within the state. And so it comes with that critique, but also it's an invitation to take responsibility through that critique. And I, I, I find it very moving and very um, inspiring. So that's, that's what I see in the kind of larger picture. I, I would add that, uh, to my opinion, the most important thing about this film is the conversation it has created with other subjects close to it uh, within the Israeli society and also outside the Israeli society about the mess in the 1950s when millions of Jews came from all over the world speaking different languages, cultural, nothing similar in the culture except a few written books that they, that they read in prayers. Um, and the fact that there was a big confusion between the private and the public with the ones who were in charge. So the, the confusion could have been subtle and not subtle, depends who we're speaking about. And this film speaks a lot about that subject. So um, I don't know if you get ask this question a lot, but what about the threats? Did any threats actually appear following the film or during the making of the film? Um, we were afraid that would come, but we didn't get threats, but we didn't get, we did get doors slammed at us, that people are not interested to go into this and not believing in, in speaking about it and not trusting a lot of fear, a lot of suspect around suspiciousness about, around this, uh, this book, uh, so that we did get, and, uh, and there might be people who know things who didn't want to speak about it, but Ezra, one of the people in the film who had a lot of documents, it took us three years to get him sp to speak with us mm. until he said, okay. Um, uh, we're going to open up in just in just a second. Uh, um, I want to ask: Does does Avi actually believe that he, he you know he will find out more? I mean, do, are there plans for a sequel? <laughs> it all depends uh, the information that comes in. If uh, there's always an option for a sequel, if we find the pages, if we 
uh, find a, a, a clear answer. Yes, there's also always an, an, a, but but for now, it's good enough that there's so many little bits of information in this film. I don't know if you managed to follow the letters, the threatening letters, the fact that we're speaking that, that people are talking about international scandals. It's all there are a lot of things. There's a big secret here that is very clear within the film, within the letters, within the visual archive material here that people uh, know that existed, but uh, the main protagonists that knew something about this are not around anymore. Um, but there is something around here, around the Yahoo and Ben Speak. And everyone has their own take. My take is exactly what we say in the end, which is once you know there is uh, someone, Ifat says it very beautifully in the end, once you know there's someone in charge, that their standards are a bit ambiguous about what is theft. Where do you put like the most important manuscripts of the Jewish world? Do you put it in your own private um, institute or in the National Library or do you ask for it or do you take it? <clears throat> so they weren't asked. Then people below are, uh, get that message and behave the same way. And Benaya was someone that was in the Hebrew U and his keys were taken away from him because he was known that where he arrives books are disappearing. And in the Bensvi Institute, this was not the only book that disappeared, a lot of books disappeared from there. So there was someone inside who who was harming books, like the the head of the institute that spoke, the, the older head of the institute. All right, let's uh, let's open up because I do have ha hands. Um, did you see who was first? Sir, I think you've had your hand up. Um, I will repeat the question. Please speak up as much as you can and I will try to repeat the question. Why did this last six years why did it take six years to make the film? Oh, excellent question. I don't know. <laughs> um, we started and then we saw we were in the wrong direction. It took a lot of time for, to get people to collaborate with us. In order to get into archives all around the world, you need to get a, 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 a funds to, to do it. and. It took time until we got people on board, and once they were aboard, a lot of people joined, but it, it took time until the doors started to open, and uh, we got collaboration. Because it was another book, another, another film about the Bible, and people didn't understand, there was another story hidden there until it started to come out. And I think the thing that opened the door mostly, this is, was surprising, very surprising for me, was that we did, well, we did a crowdfunding in early 2016, and from the crowdfunding there was a newspaper article and a TV little piece in the news, and people started spreading the word, and then it just blasted, because this is a film of a community, this film is that we got all the information we had by people giving it to us, collaborating with us, this is like, a hive mind of a lot of knowledge of a lot of people, what you see here. It's not only Avi, it's not me, it's not the researchers, it's all together. So this is when it started like jumping up on that stage. What's, what's actually the response of the Olympian community who haven't seen the film? I mean, have, have they? And, you know, and obviously, what is the Olympian community? It's so it's diverse, and, yeah. you know, <laughs> Israel and America and different Israel, places America, in America. Panama City, Mexico, there you go. yeah. The film was not shown in, in Central and South America. Uh, here it was shown in the Safra Center in Manhattan, in the Sephardic Jewish Film Festival in New York, um, in one synagogue of Aleppians, but it wasn't shown enough. But in every screening, there are Aleppians here, Syrians? One, <laughs> okay. And at the, in every screening, doesn't matter where, you see people coming who want to see the film. But it wasn't exposed enough, I think, in the within the Aleppian community. It's very hard, even for someone who's Aleppian like Avi, but from Israel and not from the U.S., to to get access and and have collaboration. Right. right. Go ahead. Um, 
there were, I tried to take your advice about concentrating on the film for all the ins and outs, and I couldn't quite do it. I picked up two and possibly a third reference to uh, somebody dying in a hotel room under suspicious circumstances. Ben Svee himself, as I recall, otherwise I think he died natural causes. Were the, was there three people in this mystery that have died mysteriously, or was there only one? It was one. So, so let me just uh, try to repeat this. Uh, so the gentleman was saying that he was trying to concentrate on uh, all the possible uh, deaths uh, in the film uh, that may have not been natural, <laughs> uh, and, and were there uh, uh, two or three in the film. Um, so Bensby died in 63. In 1987, the pages resurfaced in a hotel in Jerusalem in, in front of Musayev, who was an a, a antique merchant, by a very, very famous um, other antique merchant, uh, ultra-Orthodox. And he was the one who died. Uh, he was, a, by, according to the police, he was poisoned right after he showed the pages the same day. Um, and after that, nobody saw, and, and according to Musayef, it was between 70 to, 70 to 100 pages. But it was, you're right, it's shown in the beginning of the film, and it's shown again in, in between in the film, the same story. The one that the work oh. about. The evidence of that surfacing in the 1980s, how solid is that evidence? It seemed very slender. It, it wasn't clear how solid the evidence was of the pages emerging that they were uh, actual cater, uh, uh, crown pages. How solid was the evidence? Um, you're right. The only evidence we have is of Musayev, and some people believe him, some people don't believe him, but that's the only evidence there is. And he spoke about it, and then he was filmed in the, in the early 19, and that's what you see here. But that's the evidence there is, uh, that he got an offer. Schneebel was an uh, Arctic merchant, that's for sure. Um, but uh, the only evidence about this specific uh, thing, about seeing the the Keter pages, the Aleppo Codex pages, is by Musayev, the guy that is interviewed. Tangentially, there was the part about the Temani community where they lost all of their holy books and the Torah scrolls. Have any of those been recovered and returned to the owners, or are they still lost? The question is about the Yemenite community, the Torah scrolls of the Yemenite community. Have some of them been recovered or have they all been lost? Some of them were returned. Uh, some of them uh, ended up in private collections. Some of them ar arrived to the uh, National Library. Um, but once again, the thing here, more than anything, is that they were taken without consent. Uh, in the back, gentlemen, in the back. Yes, I, I was curious. Um, given, at least it's my understanding of the way that the community in Aleppo kept the Kekka for centuries, locked away, carefully watched it. Do we know anything about the last time that anyone actually was sure that the Kekka was in fact complete? I mean, Maimonides had it, or it this, fine, but since they didn't take it out all the time, or at least that was my understanding, the movie didn't say that, and I don't think that the Manny Cleveland's book, he mentioned that they took it out all the time either. So since they didn't take it out, when was the last time that actually anyone knows that the book was, that the Kenya was in fact complete? There weren't missing pages even before they. Basically, when was the last time anybody saw the, the crown okay. complete, even back in Aleppo? Yeah, um, it was taken... Yeah, they have it, it's been taken out from someone who Sure. It was taken out once or twice a year on very special occasions, and it was complete. It was like a little bit of something in the edge, but it was a complete book. And then we have a few testimonies here 
in this film that speak about seeing it after the fire. So there were f almost ten, nine years between the fire and when it was arrived to Israel. And we have a few testimonies of the, that say exactly the same thing. They all say there were a few pages missing, a few pages torn, and, but it wasn't all the chumash, four and a half books. It was just a tiny little bit. So that's in the, in the next stage is when it arrived to Israel. And the, the, the fact that when um, uh, Ben Svi died, Morad Faham immediately left the country, makes you wonder if he had some kind of protection, if he was paid somehow. And once he left to the US, they started being afraid and sending this letter that he's going to do an international scandal about it. So uh, we have time for one more question. Make it a good one. <laughs> anything new since the movie's been out. So the most interesting thing is being in screening like this because always after a screening someone comes with information about his family member, about someone and especially from the Syrian community um, and especially here in the US. Uh, we didn't get any more. The film was out a year ago uh, and we didn't get any new information since. There's all the time little information that is coming in, but I think that will be a good summing up of this. What Avi says in the end of the film, that once there will be an acceptance of the wrongdoings in, in those years, maybe it will allow whoever knows anything about it to come and say what he knows, because we are sure that this information is out there, especially because of all this secrecy around the Aleppo Codex and, and the fact that people think that they're not allowed to say anything. Yeah, you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that, um, it, 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 again, it's, it's the larger issue of saying, being able to say, yes, there was cultural appropriation. Yes, this thing happened. Yes, this doesn't make people, it doesn't take away who they were or what they did. But actually coming, you know, coming forward and saying, you know, I might, we might have perceived this differently at the time, and today we would like to make amends or like begin anew on this, can actually not only air the truth in many ways, but kind of rekindle the sense of solidarity that in the last, let's say, two decades has really been lost. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.